And welcome to another episode of The Family Couch. I am so excited to have with us as our guest today, Daniela Paoloni. Yeah? That's it. You got it. Yes. Uh, yes. She'll, be <laughs> she'll be talking to us today about chronic illness and how it can affect our families, either when your child has a chronic illness or when the parent has a chronic illness. So I am excited to talk about this because I know that is a topic that a lot of families deal with. So, Daniela, thank you so much for being on with us today. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be on your show. <laughs> <laughs> so, Daniela, can you tell us a little bit more about who you are and what you do? Sure. So um, I work in Westlake Village, California. I have a private practice and I work with individuals, families, and I really focus on trying to give support to families um, in a family system uh, approach or individually just to help them kind of better manage and know how to kind of work through dealing with chronic pain or illness, whether it's their child who's not doing well or whether it's an adult and, and all the things that come wrapped into that too, which is feeling anxious, feeling stressed, irritable, feeling sad, and, and kind of coping with all of these unexpected emotions that can kind of snowball yeah. when, when that sets in place. Yeah, definitely. And um, just jumping kind of right into it, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what actually denotes or makes an illness a chronic illness? That's a really good question. Um, there's a few different interpretations, but the one I find the most common is that chronic, of course, implies continuous. And so it could have peaks and valleys. You could have symptoms that are really prevalent and really impeding on your ability to work and function. And then they can kind of go on a downward trend. Right. Um, chronic can mean that it's going on for a minimum three months or more. So for doctors, for instance, that tends to be the criteria. And chronic illness and chronic pain, um, you know, it could be an autoimmune condition. It could be someone who has migraines. It could be, you know, a whole wide range. It could be Lyme disease, you know, you name it, uh, arthritis, um, gastrointestinal disorders. So it has such a wide range to, um, to encompass, you know. Wow. Yeah. And so when you're dealing with families who kind of are living through chronic illness, what do you feel are some of the most common um, I guess, issues that come up for you and the, and the families that you work with? You know, they tend to feel overwhelmed and for lack of a better word, just like deer in headlights, like, oh my gosh, you know, especially if everything was running smooth and, and as normal, you know, for a family functioning, going to school, going to work, doing soccer after school, all of these things. And then if the child suddenly has this onset of symptoms and it's not going away, parents are kind of just at a loss of like, well, I don't understand. I keep sending my child, we keep going to the doctor, we see specialists, they're doing tests, um, and we just aren't getting answers. So it can be really frightening experience. It can be really stressful. And as and of course, this is going to be really hard for the parent to, to manage their own emotions. But that's really key because, of course, children really pick up on all of that too. So if they're feeling and sensing their parent is just kind of having a really hard time with it, they, they will pick up on that too. And it will, it will affect their, their own well being. So it can really have a domino effect. Right. Right. Yeah. And so when families come to you, you know, to start working with you, what are they normally coming for? What, what normally is kind of that, that, that uh, precipitating event that makes them say, okay, we need some more help. Um, you know what they would be, there's usually some significant, whether it's, they just got diagnosed or they have a mysterious illness, you know, that's mm -hmm. another trend. It, yeah. it's, it's one thing to get a diagnosis because then it's like, oh, if there's an identifying issue, but when it's a mysterious illness and it's still going on undetected and you keep going to the doctor, so they could come in for that too. And it's like, well, my child's been sick for five years and, mm. and you know, they still don't know what's wrong with, with him or her. And so maybe they're just at a loss and they're just, they're oh. hitting a wall. Yeah. yeah. So. And 
and so when you start with them, I guess I, I would say, and this could be something that is more generic or, or more universal because I know you can't like talk about specific client things, but yeah. what do you kind of, what do you do in the session when you're dealing with the family? Let's just say where the illness is maybe something that's mysterious or something that's a little bit more rare. How do you help them kind of manage some of those, those emotions? You know what I do? I try to help normalize that for them. And so what I mean by that is like, hey, it's totally okay that you are in this in this place of being really stressed and overwhelmed. It's really uh, a normal human response. And then sometimes I'll give them a little bit of personal uh, information and say, listen, I've had my own history of chronic pain and chronic illness, mm -hmm. where it went undiagnosed for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. And it's a journey. And so, so on a personal level, I try to connect with them in that way. So they're like, oh, Someone understands. She, she, she might not have exactly what I have or my child has, but right. she gets it in some ways. Right. So yay, right. you know. So just having that collaborative, like, hey, I, I see you. I understand to a point, and how frustrating and scary it can be. And you know what? It's okay. I, I understand you, and I, I hope you, you feel that too. Mm. So I guess let's take let's talk about different perspectives. So when it is a <clears throat> parent who has the chronic illness, how can that affect the family? And how does that, how do you see that play out in families? Well, you know, that's really hard because, you know, parents, we, we all as adults have our roles, like how we see ourselves going on in life, whether we get married, have children, not have children, work independently as an entrepreneur. So we have all these identities of who we are as a person. And then if we have this sudden onset of disease or illness that does get diagnosed or doesn't get diagnosed, the fact that you're not able to function and have all, all that energy that you used to in working and taking care of your kids after school or, um, you know, volunteering on the weekends, all of those things slowly are changing. And so it can be a bit of an identity crisis. Like, oh my gosh, like I'm not, I'm not who I used to be. I feel like I'm losing a, a part of myself. And so, and then for the children, it's unsettling too, because mommy's lying down and taking a five hour nap in the middle of the day on a Saturday or, mm. or if dad, if dad's not doing well, um, maybe he's a little more irritable and moody and the kids are walking around on eggshells cause dad's in pain and he just doesn't feel very good. Right. Right. So, yeah. And so that can be really difficult too, because like you say, you have your roles and you have your vision for how you want your family to look and then chronic illness kind of strikes and it changes what you can actually do physically and emotionally for your family. Right. Right. And exactly. so how, how do you help parents to figure out how to get support, even if it is a two parent household and even more so if it's a one parent household, how do you help parents to kind of overcome some of those intense emotions so they can reach out and get support? You know, I think the best thing they can do is um, just first acknowledge that like, you know, within the couple unit, the husband and wife or, or whatever the family unit is in that sense, you know what, things are changing. Let's try and figure out what we can do and who are the solid people? Who are the people that we love, know, and trust that are either family or friends, or if they're in a religious community that they can they can reach out to where if they need someone to take the kids for half the day, um, just so uh, mom and dad can, can rest, go out and have a nice lunch, and then go to the doctor, mm -hmm. or whatever it is, just to kind of help, you know? And, um, or if cooking is too hard and it's too time consuming, you know, is there some way to get some support? And if if the family is able to connect with other families who have similar, if it's maybe it's not the same condition, but it's a similar condition, like an autoimmune condition. I mean, you know, there's a lot of overlap. And maybe there are little networks and people are like, you know what, um, I can, so-and-so is going to make a big batch of this food. And, yeah. you know, like just to have, to have that kind of support and also have those people to reach out to yeah. for either you know, running errands, hey, I'm going to the grocery store, do you need anything? Um, right. That's the thing that will really show up is if, if a family is going through this kind of a, uh, event, like it will really highlight who is really going to be there for you because mm -hmm. people will call and check in and say, hey, how are you doing? But it takes another kind of a person who says, hey, I'm going to the grocery store or hey, I'm going to you know, this fast food restaurant and I'm going to get myself something. Do you want me to get you something and drop it off? Yeah. You know, that takes the friendship or the connection to another level. And it's like, you know what, I'm, I'm actually showing up for you and I'm calling you yeah. when I'm out and do out in the world doing things yeah. and thinking of you. Yeah. And that really goes a long way. 
And then for, for parents who maybe had a chronic illness <clears throat> after some years of being a parent, like it just kind of hits, how do you help parents manage the guilt of not being able to be the same level parent? Like they're trying to rush their recovery or they're trying to get out of bed when they maybe should be resting. How do you help them manage some of that guilt that might come up for them? That's really, that's a really uh, tough uh, experience for parents and every parent has their own way of processing it. And so it takes time but um, I kind of like to reference something called the spoon theory. Mm. Um, and so people can Google that. It was um, uh, created by someone who has lupus, a woman. And essentially, it's like you're, you have so many spoons in your hand at the beginning of the day. But, every, but, but with every action you take, you get out of bed. Okay, you're getting out of bed and you're, you have to kind of sit upright for a little while before you actually get up and off the bed and standing on your feet. Okay, well, now you've got to go. Uh, to the restroom. That's going to take a unit of energy. So there goes one of your spoons. Mm. And maybe you need to take medication. But before you take medication, you need to eat something. So there goes another spoon. So all of these things take energy. And so just allowing the which takes time allowing the adult to just come to terms with hey, you know what, it's okay. You're just taking care of yourself. And by you taking care of yourself and being gentle with yourself and saying, listen, I only have so many spoons in the day. And so now I'm just going to be really conscientious of where I'm going to invest that energy. So, okay, I'm going to make breakfast, take my medicine, and then I'm going to help my kids get ready for school. Yeah. And maybe instead of working full time, I'm going to have to cut back on my hours for a mm -hmm. little while mm -hmm. or something. And of course that's devastating. Yes. But, but if it's that guilt of, oh, you know, I don't, I don't want to let my kids down. Well, by you exercising this way of, of making adjustments, that's really good role modeling for them too, to say, hey, you know what, mommy can't do all the things that she used to, but I really appreciate that, you know, she's not working 40 hours anymore. She's just working 30 hours. Mm -hmm. and, and now it's so nice because I get home and she's here. Maybe she's laying in the recliner, you know, reading a book, and maybe we don't get to play outside as much, but we still get to spend time with her. Right. And so for parents who also are having kind of, you know, like chronic illness, like you mentioned lupus, you mentioned autoimmune um, disorders or, or illnesses, how do you, do you think that parents should explain these um, illnesses to the child so the way the child kind of has a better understanding of where the parent's energy is and, and why sometimes mm -hmm. they have to take so many medications? Or I know that there are some um, illnesses where you have to have like actual medical apparatuses in the house to manage it. Mm -hmm. Do you think the parents should talk to their kid about it and tell them or kind of just keep their kids away from it? I think it's important. It's very, it's very specific to the child's age, I think. Um, and also based on the own child's like temperament, if they're a really anxious child, um, then seeing like a breathing machine is probably really going to um, freak them out. But you know what, it's also reality. You know, there are, I mean, good luck trying to keep that out of the child's uh, eye, vision in, right. if it's in the home, right? right? Right, So I think just explaining it in a way that really matches the child's language of like, what are the words that they use? How do they describe things? Like maybe if you're, you know, when you read your child's story, uh, a bedtime story, and there's like a scary monster or something, you know, what words, um, read, you know, really match, like that will help the child understand of like, this is mommy's medicine. Mm -hmm. You know, mommy has um, sometimes... Uh, it's, it sometimes feels like there's a big elephant sitting on mommy's chest or something. Yes. And so this medicine helps uh, mommy breathe, breathe a lot easier and it helps mommy have more energy. Right. You know, just keep it simple. Right. But I think bottom line, regardless of age, you have to acknowledge it because otherwise it becomes like this forbidden thing of like, Oh, there's this big yes. elephant in the room and we're not going to talk about it. And then it can kind of be like this thing of like shame or taboo and Oh, well, I don't know. We don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. And that's, I don't think that's a good approach at all. So. Right. Definitely. Okay. So then let's switch gears maybe to something that might be a little bit more harder to deal with, which is when your child has that chronic illness, how do you help parents kind of manage what it feels like to parent a child who, again, is not able to always play, is not able to always do some of the traditional things that children can do? Okay, well, I think the first thing parents need to do, which again, is a lot easier said than done, is to really check in with their own stress and their mm -hmm. own means of coping. Um, that is number one, because if the parent is able to really check in with themselves and say, mm, can I self-reflect or, or have like you and your spouse or you and your partner in this, kind of take, take inventory of like, how is, how is he dealing with this? Oh, I'm noticing he's snapping more at me or mm -hmm. he's um, not giving my other child as much attention now. And he's kind of coddling the sick child. We need to kind of work on that, you know, so either having you each kind of 
take note and observe and go, okay, let's, you know, we're a team. Let's, you know, make sure we're not doing this or I'm noticing you're, you're getting more stressed. Maybe go get a massage or yeah, yeah. some kind of self care because <clears throat> things need to, in order for the child to get the support they need, the parent needs to be that grounding force of stability and calm and comfort. Right. And if, if mom and dad are kind of spiraling and anxious and worried and yeah. overprotective, like helicopter, like, oh, don't fall, you know, right. all of that just can feed into that fear of, and the, the mental uh, mindset of the child being, oh, I'm, I must really be sick. And right. it can exacerbate it. And when a child is more stressed, well, when a parent is more stressed, the child is more stressed. Definitely. And if the child is more stressed, that lowers their immune system, that lowers mm -hmm. their ability to, um, to, be on a path towards getting healthy and, re and recovery. Right. So, so when I approach it with parents, I, I sometimes bring in, you know, if you say stress management, sometimes parents are like, oh, okay, yeah, I've heard that before. But it's like, no, but let's take it to another level. Let's take right. it to the level of like the biology of stress and how right. stress impacts, impacts our body and our immune system and our ability to heal. And, and I'll tell them, you know, the only time the body can really heal is in we're in, when our body is in a parasympathetic nervous system state, which is the rest and digest. And ideally that happens when we're eating because then our, you know, we're sedentary. We're just experiencing that moment of eating a meal yeah. when we're sleeping at night. Um, of course that would be nice, but when we're stressed, the opposite happens, which is the stress response. Yeah. And so if that gets activated, the body's natural ability to heal itself goes offline. Yes. So I try to bring in that piece and then they look at it a little bit differently instead of, Oh, she's going to tell me to do yoga and meditate or go sit outside <laughs> and breathe and do deep breathing. Like, Oh, that's so over said, right, right, right. you know? <laughs> so I try to balance it out a little bit like, okay, well, but there's some science behind it too. Right. And so then they're like, okay, all right, I'll, I'm hearing you now, you know? Yeah. So. And you mentioned something that I think, you know, I've seen before, and I'm sure you've seen a lot, which is when a child is sick, parents tend to be a little bit more overprotective. They tend to be, you know, very, very aware of what's going on every second of their kid's life. And what I would love to know is when the, with the chronic illness, a lot of times it's pervasive, right? This is something that that child probably would have to have to live with for the rest of their life. How do you help a parent teach their child how to take care of their body so the parent is not always making sure they have the medication, making sure they go to the doctor's appointment. Because mm -hmm. again, at, at a certain point, the child is going to have to take ownership of their own health. So how do you help parents kind of prepare their child to do that? I think that's a really good question because, you know, um, you're right. You know, sometimes people end up going into remission. So maybe mm -hmm. they won't have it for the lifetime, right. but then maybe it will resurface when they're an adult. Either mm -hmm. way, it's so important to try and help the child feel empowered. Like, you know what, there are decisions I can make. So maybe making it more of a problem solving collaborative process of depending on the child's age, but you want them to like start developing those tools and inner resources of like, okay, what makes me feel better when my tummy hurts mm. or what, what helps me when I feel like I'm going to faint? Oh, yes. well, you know, um, sitting on my favorite couch with my yeah. soft blankets and my teddy bear, mm -hmm. if they're a little kid, or if they're older, um, you know, something maybe similar or, you know, reading my favorite book or watching my favorite movie that makes me laugh because laughter is medicine, you know, mm -hmm. just something and being in company, you know, just trying to help them come up with some ideas and you can maybe propose some ideas of like, well, what do you think of this? But always posing it in a question mm -hmm. because ultimately you want them to make that decision and you're also sending them the message of, hey, I trust you to, to know, to know that you know enough about your body. Yes. And that you ultimately know what's best, what will help you. Right. Um, and, and that's a really important message for children. And then as they get older, uh, middle school, high school, college, you know, once they leave the house, yeah. mom and dad aren't going to be able to, to be as involved. So you're really doing them a, a service. You're really benefiting their coping and um, inner ability to manage this right. because they'll have those tools that will keep developing into adulthood. And then too, I think it also helps um, the kid with their self image because having a chronic illness can make them feel like they're weak or they're mm -hmm. fragile or something's wrong with them. But I think, you know, engaging them and collaborating with them helps them to feel like, okay, I have some say, right? And mm -hmm. I feel that same way with parents too. But I think for kids, especially, it's like, I have some say in what's going on with me. I'm not just this weak, fragile child who has to mm -hmm. be in the hospital all the time, but I can mm -hmm. say, 
I want to do this, or I would like to start doing this for myself. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it's all about empowerment. And so even when parents are talking about their child, being really mindful, whether the child is present or not, mm -hmm. don't use words like we, like, oh, we're not feeling good today. Yeah. Or something like that, because there can be, you know, how mom and dad or other people talk about that child who's unwell can really add on to the feeling of the child feeling like they're a burden mm. or feeling like they're being pitied. Yeah. And I know I got that as an adult. I'm like, listen, I don't need your pity. I, like, please, like that is not yeah. helpful. Yeah. So, so it's a fine line of how are you going to phrase things and say, you know, she's, she's just not feeling good today. So she couldn't join us for this right. family gathering. Right. Um, but she says hello and leave it at that, you know, right. It's, right. or she's going to call, she'll call you guys tomorrow yeah. uh, when she's feeling better. Definitely. You know, and so I know that <clears throat> you have like, you know, a set of strategies and tips that you like to offer families when they're going through this. So are there any that you want to kind of give to us or share with us that way, you know, those who are listening, whether they are dealing with it or they are close to someone who's dealing with it, they kind of know how to help and be supportive. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so some of these we touched on a little bit, but I think um, sometimes doing less is more as a parent. Mm -hmm. So again, like, if your child is not well and they have a lot of fatigue and they're in pain or they're, you know, they're just not feeling so great, you know, maybe it's your instinct as parent to like, okay, you know what? They can't do their chores anymore. I'm just going to take that off their plate. Yeah. It's like, you know what? Um, maybe try and negotiate that. Try not to go to that like degree quite yet. See, see where they're at. Let them get ready on their own in the morning, you right. know, and if they need help, they can ask for it. Right. But don't do that because what can happen is the child can start to feel a little bit like maybe smothered mm. or or resentful just because yeah. it's like, oh, she's always around or oh, dad's always asking, yeah. you know, or they, that's the other thing is like, oh, how are you feeling today? It's like, okay, you know, maybe don't ask all the time. Like if I, yeah. because then it, because then it draws the attention to the problem. Yeah. Um, and instead you want the child to focus on what's working. So I think, you know having a conversation at the end of the day of like, okay, well, what went well today? What, you know, mm -hmm. even though you weren't able to go to the movies with your friends after school today, um, you know, it was nice that Christy came over uh, after the movie to visit with you, Yes, you know, and, and so maybe they say something like that. So it draws attention away from the loss or what bummed them out and about, Hey, you know what, this is really cool because she, she showed up and supported me and I'm, I'm really appreciative. And I'm coping and I'm compromising and I'm not beating myself up about it. Right. Right. You know, um, understanding their language. Mm -hmm. So just using the language that they use, you know, when children are a lot younger, of course, vocabulary won't be necessarily on the, the, the big thing right. that they'll be using, but they might be more visual. So maybe using colors, right. um, animals, you know, um, maybe there's a, an animal that to them, they really are drawn to like a mm -hmm. dolphin or a horse. That's like, represents to them stability and strength and comfort. And maybe they have a stuffed animal that represents that. So that can be a good indicator too. And then if the child, whether they're young or, or older, if they're in a lot of pain and then a parent asks them, okay, well, how are you feeling or what's going on? The reality that the person or child can actually like verbalize it might not really be realistic mm. because they're just in so much pain that it's even painful to talk. Yeah. Right. So for, for, the parent just to kind of get in tune with, Oh, you know, gosh, they, I can tell they're in pain because it's showing on their face. Or for me, if I'm in a lot of pain, I, I lose my complexion. I get whiter and whiter, you know? Yeah. Um, and I start to move a little bit slower. Um, but for a child, you know, maybe, so aside from checking into their body cues, um, also looking at, um, giving them a little visual of like a smiley face and a sad face or expressions of a child and which one they connect with. And you're like, okay, or if it's a color, like if they're really not feeling good, maybe it's like a mustard yellow color. I don't know, you know? And so they're like, oh, I'm feeling like mustard right now. And you're like, oh, okay. So, you know, just just as a way to check in. Right. Okay. Right. Um, let's see. And we talked about the challenges with pain, when pain is what when pain is invisible. Yes. Um, or yes. the condition hasn't been diagnosed. Either way, whether that is the situation or if it is a diagnosed condition, um, how is that going to transition and, and work in the school setting? Yeah, yeah. Now, if a child has a visual um, disability, you know, they have, uh, they have, they're in a wheelchair or they're using a cane or something that's visually um, obvious for other children to see, then, then that typically registers as, oh, okay, they have, they have something going on with their health. Right. 
Right. But if someone appears on the outside healthy, they can get, children can get a hard time um, yeah. with that. And say, yeah. you look fine. You're, what are you trying to get attention? Or yeah. And the same can happen with adults too, where adults Agreed. and sometimes parents doubt. They doubt that their child is really sick. Like, oh, it's just all in your head, you know, psychologically. So that's very delicate. And, yeah. you know, does that show up in a school setting? Sometimes it does. So reaching out to the school, the counselor, the support staff, the teachers, mm -hmm. having a meeting just to say, hey, this is what's going on. Here's a note from the doctor. You know, what can we do? What kind of plan can we uh can we look into if my child is, are, is having a flare-up of symptoms and they're in class? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. can they just raise their hand and like be excused to the nurse, no questions asked? Right. Because children don't, typically, the children don't want attention, especially among their peers. Right. You know, maybe they're, they're gonna wanna sit in the back or closest to the door. So that way if they get up, it's not like a big thing, like, oh, there they go again, like drawing attention to the problem, you know? Right. Um, so, you know, and also with support tools. So like I brought, I brought like, you know, I have like silly putty, you know, or different Play-Doh or different things that they can use maybe if they're feeling a lot of pain, but they're still okay. They're like, it's not enough where I need to get up and, and leave. I just need to like have something to squeeze in my hand or I'm just feeling mm -hmm. really anxious. Right. right. Just some different tools to cope. And I think some of these tools too work for, for the parent who might be chronically ill, who's still trying to work or still mm -hmm. trying to be as active as they can, because I think you bring up a really good point, which is when there's an invisible illness, you know, like I know some of the autoimmune things and fibromyalgia and things like that don't mm -hmm. always have like physical symptoms. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people can, I know for a fact, like with fibromyalgia, people can mm -hmm. sometimes be like, oh, you're just, you know, take some Tylenol or mm -hmm. you'll be fine, you know, and things like that. And I think it's really important that if you're trying to support someone who has a chronic illness, especially if they're parent especially if they're trying to raise a family that you listen to them when they mm -hmm. say they're hurting you don't try to you know fix it so to speak or give them an advil because that'll just take it away <laughs> like really trying to listen yes and when people do that it's really pretty insulting it's like a broken record too and that's the yeah. sad truth is that that's a typical dynamic when someone says something and then that's the response so the person who's not feeling well when they say oh i'm not feeling well they're like oh did you try this probiotic or did you yeah. take this pill it's like really do you think if it was that easy i would be so i would choose to suffer for this length of time like right. hello like you know so it can get annoying but then what can happen is people just the people who are hurting stop even talking about it mm. because they just don't want to deal with that feedback because yeah. it's, it's diminishing it's insulting yeah. it kind of chips away at like oh well they obviously don't really believe me so yeah. why do i even bother so that can be a that can be a slippery slope because then they can kind of go more inward right. and and just keep it to themselves so yeah and which is why i think what you said earlier about finding support groups is so important because sometimes like with some chronic illnesses there's so little known about it that if mm -hmm. you don't find other people who are in that similar kind of umbrella mm -hmm. that other people might not always understand i think that's both for kids and for adults that you really want to have that support group where yes your family and friends are mm -hmm. there but i think after a while you have to be around people who also are kind of living it they're going to the same doctor's appointments mm -hmm. they're hearing the same you know opinions from, from medical from medical professionals and mm -hmm. being able to find out okay it's okay for me to say i'm hurting even though no one else knows what's going on it's okay for me to say that this is still going on even after i've tried the yoga and the probiotics and all these things <laughs> 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 darn it yes right 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 <laughs> Well, I know that we could probably talk about this topic at nauseum because this is something that you do every day, but mm -hmm. I want to give you a space to let the audience know um, how we can connect with you and connect with your resources or your services. Yeah, absolutely. So um, anyone can go to my website, which is www.westlake, which is W-E-S-T-L-A-K-E village-counseling.com and um, on the website you'll find blog articles that kind of talk about these topics yeah. um, as well as there is a free guided meditation which people can download um, it's of the beach and I actually went to the beach and recorded the waves and you know did the, the verb the verbiage all on my own you know nice. Nice. Um, so you you would sign up for a monthly newsletter um, you get one email a month um, just sending you some articles and updates or things. I like to provide um, presentations in the community mm -hmm. that are related to chronic pain, chronic illness, nice. the relationship between pain and sleep difficulties, because mm -hmm. that's a big one that people don't necessarily tie or connect. 
And also I do presentations on tapping, which is emotional freedom technique mm -hmm. um, and that and how that can really help with pain management, emotional pain and um, and help on a biological level in supporting the body and lowering cortisol levels nice. and, and improving the relaxation response in the mm -hmm. body. So I really try to um, provide that kind of information on my website and to the community around me. Nice. Um, and I do have a presentation coming up later this year mm -hmm. at the um, Cancer Support Community Center in Westlake Village. Nice. So that's just kind of what's going on um, in the near future. <laughs> so. nice. nice. So for those of you who are listening, uh, don't fret if you weren't able to jot down any of that information. All the links to Daniela's resources will be in the show notes for this episode. So please feel free to connect with her. And if you're local to her area and you would like to kind of connect with her or go to any of her presentations, I strongly suggest that you connect with her, email or get on her list so you can learn about some of the events that she'll be presenting at. Uh, Daniela, thank you so much for being on with us today. I really appreciate your expertise and you sharing um, all of your information about this topic. Thank you so much for having me. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay, bye-bye.